Thanks for checking out another edition of Octagon Outlook. I'm your host, James Lynch. As we do every week, we like to get a guest co-host on here. And today I'm happy to be joined by UFC featherweight Justin Janes, live on location in Las Vegas, where he's getting a hell of a lot better than where I'm at right now in Vancouver. Justin, how's it going, man? Hey, man, it's going really good, Mr. Lynch. Appreciate you guys having me. Just enjoying this uh, view, uh, this beautiful Vegas weather. It's about 80 degrees right now, so I'm just going to sit outside, drink my rock star, and let's, cho- let's chop it up. Yes, a lot better than uh, Michigan right now. I'm sure they're getting hit with the snow, but uh, we're not here to talk weather. we got a lot to talk about fight-wise. As I would like to remind everyone off the top, we do do this show every week at 1.15 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, usually it's on Mondays today, Canadian Thanksgiving. Had to bump it a day, so really appreciate you guys tuning in today. Uh, make sure you hit that subscribe button and that like button. My best interviews are always on this channel. All right, let's get into it. UFC Fight Island 5, a huge main event. Marlon Marais, Corey Sanhagen, and is Corey Sanhagen getting the wheel kick knockout in this one? Justin, I picked Corey Sanhagen to win this fight, but I did not think a spinning wheel kick would get the job done. How surprised were you that Sanhagen was able to finish Marais? Because I think people were picking him, but I don't think they felt the finish was coming. What did you think? Well, this if we're talking about that spin kick uh, after catching the round kick, this, this, is, this is a pretty incredible feat, I must say, because... To generate that much power while having one leg in the air is pretty incredible. I think it's a candidate for knockout of the year. I don't think anybody's going to come close. I think it could be the best knockout in UFC history, to be honest. Uh, like I said, to generate that kind of power uh, while one leg being held is is pretty insane. And, and to, to, to knock him out, it wasn't like he hit him and he fell down. He was iced, man. So, you know, I, I was blown off. Uh, hats off to the guy. I, I think it was an incredible knockout. I think that, you know, I, I believe his uh, his Instagram feed went from 3,000 followers to over 70,000 followers overnight because of this kick. This guy's life's changed. Congratulations. Yes, that's the walking Buckley KO. We will get to that in a second here, but I was actually talking about the main event where Corey Sanhagen uh, finished Marlon Marais. Uh, you know, Marais is a pretty oh. durable bantamweight. The only other guy to finish him, I think in his career was, uh, at least uh, recently, was Henry Cejudo. Uh, for Sanhagen, there's some title implications involved, bouncing back from that loss to Aljamain Sterling. What did you think of, I know it's not your division, but Corey Sanhagen just getting such a big win here in the main event where a lot of people were counting him out? You know, honestly, I, I've never heard of the guy before, uh, but, you know, when they're, when, they're, uh, when I was watching the they were talking about how he has the most significant strikes landing. He was landing like five to six significant strikes per minute of each fight. Uh, so I, I knew Marais had uh, had his hands full, uh, to say the least. I didn't see the spin kick coming, and it just looked like it grazed the top of his head. You know, and the people I was watching it with, like, oh, that wasn't even a hard shot. Listen, when you get hit in the top of the temple or above, you know, it's it's going to mess you up. I've been kicked in the head before. It's no fun. Um, congrats. Great spin kick. And uh, he, he beat a very, very tough opponent. Like you said, Henry Sudo being the only one to, uh, to finish him. Very, yeah, very, very good, big implications as well. We'll talk about sort of what's next for the bantamweight title pitcher in a second here, but let's get to the co-main event. It is Edson Barbosa finally getting his first win at featherweight, uh, you know, getting the Khani. And credit to Amir Khani, he took some good shots in this one, was able to survive, but ultimately Edson Barbosa striking, being the difference in this fight. This is your division, Justin. What did you think of this fight with Barbosa notching his first UFC win? And let's not also forget, he uh, fought your teammate, Dan Ige, in the fight before that. Yeah, you know, it's you know, I think the big game changer, you know, for Barbosa was growing the beard, man. When I saw him walk out, I <laughs> yeah. beards are beautiful, man. They bring power. Uh Barbosa I thought looked great. Uh, you know, I don't you know, Barbosa coming down to one forty five, he's such a big guy and he has such lean muscle mass. I feel like going in the later rounds. Uh, he tends to fade, uh, and I thought he was in this fight, but I'm glad, he, uh, you know, he's a legend of the sport. I'm glad he got back on the winning track and pulled off the decision victory. Uh, I think, you know, I saw a little bit more takedowns uh, than than I'm used to seeing Edson Barbosa feel. Uh, but again, hats off. You know, it's beard power, man. He comes through, snaps his two, three fight losing streak, and he's back on the right track now. And, and obviously implications are high for this one. I know Barbosa wants a top six opponent. Uh, you know, does he want to wait around for a Josh Emmett when he's healing from injuries? We'll see if that's an option. Uh, featherweight's getting very interesting, yourself included. And obviously we'll talk about your fight coming up here in a few weeks, but uh, really big win there for Barbosa. Amir Khani, that's now two losses in his last three fights. I mean, he's an exciting guy. I'm sure the UFC will book him against someone uh, decent in the next outing, but let's not also forget that this guy took this fight on short notice. This was supposed to be Sudik Yusuf. So for Amir Khani to go to the distance with a guy like Barbosa who has some serious knockout 
Jericho Power. Kudos to him. Uh, Barbosa with a big win there. Uh, we got to talk about the heavyweights. Uh, this was a way better fight than I thought it was going to be. Marcin Tybura getting the decision over Ben Rothwell. Uh, you know, credit to Tybura because there was a point when he had lost a couple fights in a row. He was on a bit of a losing streak. Uh, he had a lot of momentum earlier in his UFC career. Uh, it seems like he's gained that back getting a win over Ben Rothwell. What did you think of this fight? Because uh, I thought Tybura really, uh, you know, showed his skill set in this one and really put on a pretty entertaining fight. You know, Ben Rothwell has been along for a long time, man. So that's a guy you can never count out, you know, for, for, for his opponent to come in and, and, and put it to him and, and grind out the decision, man. I'm, I'm very happy to see it. Congratulations to him as well. Like I said, Ben Rothwell has been around a long time. He knows the fight game real well. Uh, some people say that I look like little Ben Rothwell. So, you know, I'm always, I'm always rooting for the bald guy with the beard and uh, you know, uh, again, hats off to his opponent for coming through and taking on uh, such, such a great competitor. And I think Ty Burrow sort of passed that sort of gatekeeper status at this point. This was another big win for him. Uh, you know, I think he's going to start getting some more contenders again. And for Rothwell, I think it's probably prospects from here on out, you know, trying to build up other guys over him. He's 38 years old. I think we can agree that Rothwell is probably not fighting for a title anytime soon. Is that kind of how you see things with the heavyweight division right now? Because Rothwell kind of needed to win this fight to continue his momentum and, and going towards that title. But this is a really big setback for him. I mean, getting, getting into the later years of your career, you know, like you said, he's 38 years old, you know, it's it, the, the chance of him, him coming back and, you know, being in title contention after winning one or two, he's going to have to win, you know, three, four, five fights in a row now. And the heavyweight decision, division is so stacked right now, you know, with John Jones moving around, Stipe, DC says he's not coming back, but who knows what he's doing. Yeah, man, I, you know, I, unfortunately, I see Ben Rothwell as, as more of a stepping stone for these up and coming guys uh, to knock off a name. But then again, with all that experience, don't count him out. He's going he's gonna to create some upsets uh, when these guys are coming through. And then we'll just kind of go through the last couple of fights here a little bit quickly. Uh, Duplices getting the knockout win over Marcus Perez. This kid uh, looks like the real deal. I shouldn't call him a kid. I'm not that much older than him, but uh, at middleweight, I mean, this seems like a pretty exciting prospect uh, in this division coming over from EFC. Uh, what did you think of that knockout? Because Marcus Perez is a pretty tough guy to finish and to do it in the first round, I thought sort of made a bit of a statement there. Uh, you know, actually, I didn't actually see this fight, uh, so I, I don't have much insight on it. Uh, but Perez, you know, like I said, anybody getting into the UFC, anybody coming to the UFC and putting away guys, that's a, that's, that's a tough guy. Absolutely. And then we had another knockout as well uh, earlier on the main card. Uh, Tom Aspinall getting the win over Alan Badeau. Uh, this was kind of a setup fight. It was supposed to be Aspinall and Sergey Spivak. Spivak is out. Badeau gets in there. I don't think he had fought in a couple of years. Aspinall looked great. And the thing I love the most about this, Justin, was that Aspinall, after the fight, said, look, I was not happy with my performance. Even though I got the first round finish, I know I'm capable of a lot more. I like the honesty. I like the assessment. This is another guy to keep an eye on uh, in the heavyweight division. Uh, I think they should rebook that speedback fight, but uh, I thought very impressive. Not sure if you caught that one, but if you didn't, it wasn't very long, so it'd be easy to find on, uh, on anywhere on the internet, right? Yeah, well, with, with that being said, too, you're talking about a first round finish. The guy's assessing you know, that he has more to offer than that. We want to get in and get out. You know, it's the, the, the quicker we can get in and get out and then still be disappointed with your performance says a lot about him, says a lot about his character. Uh, this guy's hungry and he's going to go far in the sport. And then last one I wanted to talk about, obviously, opening up the main card. Yusuf Zalal finally gets his first UFC loss, ends up losing to Tapuna, uh, who looked fantastic. Uh, just, you know, every facet of this fight, he looked great. I, I'll give Zalal credit in that third round. He looked pretty solid, but uh, ultimately it was, it was too much uh, for Zalal in this fight. That was Zalal's fourth fight, so probably going to get some well-deserved time off. But uh, this newcomer that we got, 9-0, and uh, looked, looked really solid on, uh, on Saturday. And it's actually in your division as well. So if you didn't catch it, you probably got to go back and uh, check that one out because, uh, yeah, like I said, someone to keep an eye on in that division yeah if, he, if he's up and coming man dude, him and i could cross paths at any time i need to go and uh, i need to watch some film on this cat you know right right now featherweight division is wide open uh you know i believe that featherweight lightweight are the two duff, uh the, mo the toughest divisions not to mention they have the most fighters too so you know it's it's uh it's hard to be a featherweight right now man i gotta keep my eyes open on my left and my right in front and behind because these guys are coming and they're coming hard Let's quickly go through the prelims. Uh, Tom Breeze getting back in the win column. Really impressive win over Canadian KB Buller. Uh, just great to see Breeze put it all together. He's had a lot of issues outside the cage, you know, suffers from anxiety. For him to go out there and stop a guy in KB Buller was undefeated. Huge win there. How about Chris Dawkins getting the knockout win over Rodrigo Nascimento? Uh, here's a guy to keep an eye on at heavyweight. Uh, you know, pretty young prospect. This was sort of the heavyweight prospect showcase on this card as well. Just a lot of good performances, including Dawkins. But what everyone's talking about, that highlight reel knockout, Joaquin Buckley over Impa Kasanage. Uh, you know, this is great because, you know, uh, uh, Joaquin Buckley was a guy that got knocked out by Kevin Holland in his last fight in highlight reel fashion. So for him to go out there, 
uh, for, for Impa to catch that kick, for him to bounce off his other leg and kick him in the face for just uh, one of the best knockouts in UFC history. And l- let's just leave it at that. It's, it's one of the best in UFC history. I see people already debating, was it the best? Was it, you know, let's just enjoy it. I love this knockout. Shout out to Ray Rod if people haven't seen that rendition that he did of the knockout. Just absolutely amazing. Uh, Good for Joaquin Buckley. This was a guy that had grinded for years on the regional scene for him to go out there and get a win like this. And what is it? Eight, nine, 10, 12 million views now on, on YouTube and all over social media. Good for him. Uh, You know, you're a guy who had a highlight reel knockout yourself. How cool is it to see Joaquin go out there and, and get that himself? I tell you what, I, I you know I I had a good I had a good finish, but I didn't have any highlight reel knockout like this. This was incredible. Like I said earlier, you know I'm so excited about this knockout that I even started talking about it before we started talking about it. That to generate again this this kind of power, he get his foot caught, his foot is in the air, and he's still able to jump in the air, spin, hit him with the heel right in the mouth, and it's not like the guy stumbled backwards and, and, and it was a stoppage. This guy was out. His arms were stiff. He fell down, and the fight was over. Uh, hats off. Again, you know, I, I don't like to say, oh, what's, you know, talk about what was the greatest knockout to put number one, but it's definitely up there, if not the greatest knockout. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. Um, man, it's, it's, uh, this is going to be talked about for a long time, man. Congratulations to Buckley coming through and, uh, you know, just reacting at the right time because, you know, I've been in a lot of positions. I've had people catch my leg before, and my first reaction never is, oh, I'm going to jump in the air and spin and kick this guy in the face so again hats off an incredible athlete an incredible fighter i'm I'm happy for him like i said his uh his social media went from 3,000 followers to over 65,000 70,000 followers uh this guy's the real deal he's gonna have to show up next time and uh you know if people are expecting big things man so i'm happy for buckley and uh i hope he can do it again Absolutely. And uh, we're going to actually skip the rest of the prelims. If you guys have any questions, shoot me a DM on Twitter or Instagram. Happy to answer them. But we got so much to talk about today. So we're going to move on to this Fight Island 6 card, of course, headlined by the Korean Zombie and Brian Ortega. Uh, but we're going to start first on the prelims. And uh, do you want to mention uh, for our Canadian listeners, check out blitzbet.eu. That's where you can find all the best odds. Uh, check that out. I use it all the time. That's what we're going to be referencing here today. Um, let's start, though, with uh, with Kraus and, uh, and Claudio Silva. So Kraus taking this on short notice. Uh, you know, kudos to him. Uh, you know, most books right now, just looking on, um, on blitzbet.eu, we do have odds for this one. So James Crow's coming in at minus 179, Claudio Silva plus 145. Uh, I talked about this on my show this morning. I like James Krause in this fight, but I do want to warn people that Kraus has been a busy guy. I mean, Justin, I know the community is small. You probably hear all of what James Krause has been doing lately, but he's been doing a lot of coaching, right? We had Kevin Kroon. We had Grant Dawson earlier this year. Uh, he is everywhere in terms of helping out his fighters. So I do wonder what type of camp he's had. I know that he's been in shape. I know he's the guy that's ready to take this. I mean, he's been very selective about who he wants to fight. So I'm sure he's not just taking this, you know, thinking he's going to lose. I, it's not like he's doing it for a paycheck. Kroos has a lot outside the cage. And I do like him as the favorite here. I am going to pick him to win here. Um, but I just do wonder what type of camp he's had. My, my knock on Claudio Silva really is that he's just barely fought. Um, There's a huge gap uh, when he fought between Leon Edwards and Nordin Taleb uh, from 2014 to 2018. He didn't fight. He did fight two times last year. But, uh, you know, you got to wonder with him at uh, 38 years old, uh, I know very dangerous, very well-rounded, but uh, I like Kraus here. I think he's uh, the fresher guy, um, you know, a lot more active as well. And and I just think his his fight IQ is something that can never be messed with in this fight. I think minus 179 is not a bad not a bad line to take James Kraus in this fight, but I do wonder what type of camp he's had. So personally, I would tell people to stay away. The pick's going to be Kraus, but what do you think of this fight in the welterweight division? Pretty interesting to see James Kraus back in action on short notice. Yeah, you know, James Cross, I'm a big James Cross fan, and I bet against him one time, and I'll never do it again. We're talking about a long, long range uh, that can can put people away on the feet, can uh, can put people away on the ground. This is a guy you can't count out. Now, you can say in his personal life, he's coaching and this and that, but you have to understand a lot of the fighters, or even the coaching, even my coaching staff is going to jump in and train. James Cross is a veteran of the sport. He's been around, I believe he was on the Ultimate Fighter, the, the live Ultimate Fighter, uh, you know, five or six years ago, uh, maybe even a little bit longer than that. This is, again, we're going to go back to experience. And like you said, his opponent took four years off, 2014, 2018 off. I have James Cross winning. And uh, if the line gets any closer, I'm stacking up against it. And, and across uh, on the Ultimate Fighter two times, actually, first time in 2012, then he was on the comeback season or whatever they called it. The uh, uh, it was the it was the course all, all the uh, UFC alums where they did the Ultimate Fighter there back in 2017. But Kraus, a lot of experience and got to mention too, Kraus with a height and reach advantage in this fight. I like his odds in this one. But like I said, I'm going to stay away. Just sit back and enjoy this one and not put any money on this one. Uh, let's get to the uh, sorry, this, that was the main card, I should say. That's not on the prelims. Uh, but let's get to the other fight on the main card as well. Uh, we have uh, M- Matthias. Uh, uh, Gamrot, uh, really excited for this guy. He's been making a lot of noise in KSW, making his UFC debut 17-0, taking on Guru 
program. And uh, right now, if you look on blitzbet.eu, you can see uh, G- Gamrot is a pretty sizable favorite here. Minus 303, plus 240 for his opponent here. Uh, I'm on the Gamrot train. I've been hearing about this guy for years. Uh, I think he's going to go in there and make a statement. I think the biggest question in this fight is, can he finish it? Um, I, I, it's, it's possible for sure. But I, I think just, uh, you know, this is a guy you could parlay. I do feel very confident he's going to get it done. I think the UFC knows what they have. And, you know, it's interesting because if you're a hardcore fan, you've heard of Gamrot for years. But if you're one of these guys that just sort of tunes into the UFC cards and the UFC cards only, you're probably not even familiar with this guy. Whereas, you know, a guy like Michael Chandler gets signed, you probably know who that is. But Gamrot, trust me when I tell you, this guy is the real deal at lightweight. Excited for his debut. I think he gets it done. Do you know much about this guy, uh, Justin James? Not sure if you do, because it's tough to keep up with the promotions outside the UFC. Yeah, man, honestly, I, I don't know much about him, uh, you know, but when it comes to a, over a plus or excuse me, a minus 300, I'm going with the dog. And it's just a, more of a personal thing for me because I was minus 300 and, or excuse me, uh, my opponent, you know, Frank Camacho was minus 300 when I came in and I'm always rooting for the dog and that feeling, you know, his opponent knows their urgency. You know, if he's that much of a dog, he's, he's taking the fight. You know, his team and he, he, excuse me, his team and himself believe that they can beat this guy. So uh, I, I don't know much about him, um, you know, but I, I'm, I'm going to take the dog here. Yeah, it should be interesting to see how this fight uh, plays out. By the way, I'm looking, I don't know if this is on the main card, but I do see on Tapology right now, they have, it looks like six fights on the main card or something crazy like that. Usually it's only four. So uh, not sure if this will be on the main card, but either way, it doesn't hurt to preview that fight as well. Let's get to the Bantamweight fight. I'm really excited for this one. It was supposed to be Thomas Almeida taking on Alejandro Perez. Perez is out. Jonathan Martinez is in. And right now on blitzbet.eu, you can see Thomas Almeida as uh, as a slight favorite here, which is interesting because I've seen some books have him as the underdog, but Almeida is the favorite here jonathan martinez minus 103 so depending on which book you look at here you could see either guy favored but uh, this is a great replacement here of course almeida if you guys saw our interview here on the channel has not fought since january of 2018 um he is a guy that uh, had had an eye injury uh you know took him out of action for quite some time and then obviously COVID hit earlier this year so he would have wanted to be in a little bit earlier this year um you know you look at the record and how he's you know this is a guy who's undefeated at one point he's got three losses but i like to point out to a lot of people that look at who he's lost to in the UFC, Cody Garbrandt, Jimmy Rivera, Rob Font. I mean, you don't get any tougher than that in the bantamweight division. So it's very easy to overlook, um, you know, Thomas Almeida here. And conversely for Jonathan Martinez, here's a guy that lost his UFC debut, realistically should be on a four fight win streak. The one loss in there was to Andre. We'll love Andre, but I think most people watching that fight at UFC 247 felt like that should have gone the other way. Of course, he's coming off that big win over Frankie Signs in his last fight, but he did miss weight for that fight. Not sure if you got any thoughts on this one. I know Almeida did spend a bit of time at Extreme Couture. Not sure if you were there for that, uh, Justin, but uh, I like Thomas Almeida in this fight. I think on paper, he is the better fighter. Uh, It's just a matter of if he can put it together with a long layoff. So uh, your thoughts on this fight? Yeah, I'm going to have to go along with the same thing. You know, COVID and everything, maybe give him a little bit of a layoff. And like you said, he uh, he had the eye injury. Uh, He's been in the the gym. Uh, He's a tough dude. It's, uh, again, a, a veteran of the sport. Tough to go against vets. I'm taking Almeida as well. Yeah, I just uh, I think with a, a line that's this close, you got to go with the better fighter on paper. And I've been a fan of Martinez as well. But I mean, there was that one win a couple fights ago where he fought. Uh, I'm going to bring up his name here. Just hold on. It was another highlight reel finish, of course. Uh, the Pang Yan Lu fight. That was a fight that Martinez was losing. And it was only at the last minute in that third round where he got the knee knockout. You can't be doing that. You should, he, Martinez should be beating a guy like that. Um, and like I said, I know Almeida has been off for a while, but I've just been more impressed with him in the octagon so far. So I'm going to pick uh, Thomas Almeida. But this is a really close fight. And I definitely agree with the odds on this one. Let's go to the light heavyweight division with Deskis Bukalkis, second UFC fight taken on another sort of up and comer in the division and Jimmy Crute. Uh, if you look right now on blitzbet.eu, you will see that uh, Jimmy Crute is the favorite at minus 357, Modestus Bukalkis plus 270. I don't agree with this line. I do think uh, Crute should be favored here just for the simple fact he's got four fights in the octagon as opposed to Modescus, who's only got the one fight in there, which was a bit controversial. If you remember in his debut, Modescus uh, basically was beating this guy and then uh, they, it was in between rounds and they opened up the cage door and his opponent fell through and they took that as like he was out. Um, so there was some controversy there, but I think it was Modestus was going to win that fight anyways. But uh, I don't agree with this line here. I think Modescus very battle tested. Here's a guy that had a really good career outside the UFC. Um, he's uh, a little bit older than his opponent, Jimmy Crute, but still uh, the resume in terms of what he brought into the UFC. This is a guy who looked outstanding in Cage Warriors. He's had a good camp. I had a chance to speak to Modescus before this fight. He's more than ready for it. But usually when I see this type of matchmaking, it's like the UFC trying to figure out who the better prospect is because Modestus, like I mentioned, uh, 26 years old. Old, Jimmy Crute, uh, 24 years old. So these are two of the youngest guys in the division. They're trying to figure out who the better guy is. 
I'm going to pick Jimmy Crute in this fight. No way I'm betting that amount. And in fact, I think there is some value in Modestus Bukakis as the underdog in this fight. Uh, because if you look here, he's actually got a slight uh, height and uh, and reach advantage in this one. So uh, G- uh, Modestus has actually got a reach of 78, whereas Jimmy Crute's only got a reach of 72 and a half. So if he's able to utilize that reach, things could get very interesting. But uh, your thoughts on this fight? Because, um, yeah, really exciting fight on, on the main card. You know, I'm going back to experience. You're talking about the four fights to the one. You know, somebody that's had two fights in the UFC, like myself, you know, you, you have to understand the whole process of, now, when have they fought? Do they have an, do they have the arena full? Do they fight at, you know, if they're fighting at Fight Island? Like, this is a big thing, too. So, I think experience is going to play a factor here. Four fights to the one. You know, I'm going to take experience, man. I, I, I'm taking experience here for, for this fight. So Crute has never, has, has always had a crowd because he last fought in February, whereas Modestus actually made his debut during the pandemic in July. So that's another thing too. Will the momentum, will he be able to sort of build off that win in July into this fight? We'll see, but um, should be very interesting in this one. Uh, yeah, I like I said, the pick is going to be Crute. I think he's the better fighter on paper. Like you said, I also like the experience in this one, but minus 353 for a guy that just got submitted by Misha Serkinov, someone I know that trains with you a couple fights ago. I, I don't know if I'm willing to risk that. So like I said, I think the value on this fight is on Modestus Bukalkis, who I think is one of the best up-and-comers. And we're going to learn a lot about both fighters in this fight as they're both up-and-comers, like I mentioned. Now, here's a fight I'm curious to get your opinion on, not in your division. We got the, the women's flyweight fight, Jessica Andrade moving up from strawweight now in her third division in the UFC. If you remember, she started as a bantamweight, uh, moving up to 125 to take on Caitlin Chukagan. And here's the crazy thing on Blitzbet right now. If you look at this, Andrade, the favorite at minus 141, Caitlin Chukagan plus 114. I'm a little surprised by that because Chukagan's been a mainstay at flyweight for a couple of years now. She has some good wins in that division too. And I get it. Andrade has only lost to the best of the best. I mean, we're talking about Rose Nami Yunus in her last fight she lost to. She lost the strawweight title, of course, to Wheelie Zhang. And then even before that, Yuani and Jacek was one of her last losses. Uh, it's been a couple years since she suffered a few losses in a row here. Um, but Kayla Chukagan is criminally underrated. I know a lot of fans don't like her. They don't like the fight style, but we saw in her last fight where fans were counting her out against Antonina Shevchenko. People were like, there's no way that Caitlin's going to win this fight if it stays standing. Caitlin wrestled in that fight and she looked great in that one. And Antonina Shevchenko had no answers. Jukagan Cash is a big underdog in that fight. So, uh, you know, looking at this on paper, I can understand why people are picking Andrade, but this is how I break it down. Andrade has got some of the best knockout power in, in all of women's MMA. I mean, you don't just go out there and dummy uh, uh, Caitlin or uh, Carolina Kovalkiewicz in the first round. Most women don't do that. However, if she can't get the knockout, like we saw in the Rose Nami Yunus rematch, it tends not to go her way and what did rose do she was able to keep her at bay avoid her from getting on the inside i think that exact thing could happen here against caitlin jukagan let's not forget jessica andrage is five foot one with a 62 inch reach caitlin jukagan is five nine with a 66 inch reach that's a huge height and reach advantage for caitlin jukagan not to mention the fact she's been in the division for a while she's fought the best of the best and here's the other kicker justin Caitlin Chukagan's only been finished once in her career, and that was against Valentina Shushenko, who pretty much finishes everyone here. So I'm actually going with the underdog here, and I do see value here on Caitlin Chukagan as the underdog in this one. I don't think Andrade over three rounds will knock out Caitlin Chukagan, and I see Chukagan using her reach, keeping Andrade at bay, keeping her on the outside as opposed to the inside. Even if Andrade does hit a shot there, I think Chukagan survives it. So I'm going Chukagan with the upset by decision. Curious to get your pick on this one. You know, I, I'm not very familiar with Caitlin, but I do know Andrade. And why why is she moving up? You know, she she has so much muscle and so much mass. Maybe the cuts are getting to her. Maybe that's why she's you know se- seems to be that one shot knockout power. Now with Caitlin being five foot nine with a 66 inch reach, yeah, I think I think you you hit the nail on the head. She can keep her at bay, get her frustrated again, being the bigger woman going up a weight class. Uh, you know, especially if she's the dog, what would you say? What's the line on the dog there? Plus what? The, the, yeah. Uh, Caitlin Chukagan right now is plus 114. I know not crazy odds, but I just think if you can get her at plus money and a fighter who has a clear height and reach advantage and someone who's very tough to finish, I'll take those odds all day. Yeah, I, I agree with you too. And again, going up the weight class. So maybe, maybe her cardio is going to be better. This is a tough one, honestly, because Andrade, like I said, is so big and so strong, you know, uh, on the, on the, uh, uh, on the smaller weight class. But now that she's going up, she's probably just going to be average. Still have that power. But again, I'm going to take the reach and the size advantage. Uh, I I'd take Caitlin in this one as well. So there you go. The dogs are barking in this one. We're both taking the dog uh, and Caitlin Chukagan. Let's get to the co-main event. Cyril Gain taking on Anti Jajila. I'll be honest, I don't know a ton about uh, Gain's opponent, but I've been high on Cyril Gain for a while. He actually fought in Canada for TKO. I remember watching him fight an undefeated prospect in Adam Daiska, and he looked outstanding. He got the win in just a second pro fight, and this is a guy that has continued to get good wins. Also has a win over Tanner Bozer, and we saw the role of the run that Tanner Bozer's gone on. So Gain is absolutely legit. He's only got six fights, but this is a guy that really looks like the real deal. And he 
is right now the biggest betting favorite on this card, Justin. He is minus 556 against uh, Delija, who is plus 410. Now, I, I'm picking Gain in this fight. I do think he's the better fighter. I think he there's a reason they're putting him in the co-main event. It's kind of a showcase fight to push this guy towards title contention. However, minus 550 for a heavyweight fight, there's not a chance in hell I would bet that amount, not even in a parlay, because anything can happen, right? You've got an opponent in Dejita who's got 20 fights as opposed to Gain who's only got six. Um, in terms of the height and the reach, I believe Gain has both. Let me just double check here. Uh, Gain is six foot four with an 83 inch reach. Dejita is uh, six foot five with a 79 inch reach. So actually, uh, Dejita is a little bit a uh, um, little bit taller, but the reach goes to Gain, who's got an 83 inch reach as opposed to 79. Uh, I should mention his opponent a little bit older at 30, whereas Gain is only 29. So physically kind of similar, maybe not any huge advantages here. But you look at Gain's run in the UFC already. Rafael Pessoa finish in the first round. Uh, Dante Mays finish him in the third round with a heel hook. Got a decision over Tanner Bozer. I mean, those are all solid wins for him, even just three fights in. So I'm going to go Cyril Gain in this fight. I would maybe take a look at the inside the distance prop if you can. I think you might get better value there. There, but um, I just I don't care who it is unless Stipe is fighting like a newcomer. There's no way I'm betting a heavyweight at minus 550 with the fact that every heavyweight has knockout power for the most part. Uh, that, that's too much of a risk for me there. So the pick is going to be gained, but uh, no way I would bet minus 550. Your thoughts on this fight, Justin? Yeah, I, I stay away from those 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 big numbered bets because you know I've always tried to add a little little sprinkle to my parlay bets, and I always seem to get burned, especially when I bet on teammates. I remember a while back, I had a teammate of mine; he was minus seven hundred, and he gets knocked out in the first round. And we're talking about lightweight. This is going to heavyweight, where knockouts are much more common, uh, especially in the first and second round. Uh, so. Yeah, I mean, if I was going to say who's going to win, I'm going to take the favorite, obviously, to win. Uh, but I'm not putting any money on that. It's, uh, that's uh, <laughs> that, that has disappointment written all over it. All right. Glad to get you on the show because the main event is one of the best featherweight fights, I think, of all time. I love this matchup. We've got the Korean zombie, Chan Sun Jung, taking on Brian Ortega. And should mention, you and uh, Zombie have the same management. Not that that would sway your pick at all, but just wanted to point that out. Um, and right now, the odds makers have Chan Sun Jung, the Korean zombie, at minus 189, Brian Ortega at plus 153. So a lot of implications going into this fight. First off, there's some bad blood here. We all know the story. Uh, you know, there's some tr talking trash back and forth. Uh, Korean zombie's friend, Jay Park, getting slapped by Brian Ortega at an event. So this is very personal. These guys have been wanting to fight for a while. They were supposed to fight last year uh, in the winter. Uh, but of course, Ortega suffering that ACL injury. So Frankie Edgar uh, steps in there and said, uh, the Korean zombie knocks him out in the first round in that one. Brian Ortega actually hasn't fought since December of 2018. And if you remember in that fight, Max Holloway, I believe, set the record for most significant strikes in a fight. Uh, and he absolutely dominated Brian Ortega. Do you remember going into that fight? People are saying that Brian Ortega is going to go out there and this is going to be the guy to beat Holloway. And Holloway's going to have a bad weight cut because, of course, their fight earlier that year was canceled because of uh, Holloway's weight cut. Um, and, and Holloway did. He just dominated the fight. So not only does Ortega have a huge layoff, but he's coming into this off a long, um, uh, off a pretty dominating loss, one sided loss. So that's something to keep in mind for this fight. The other thing is Brian Ortega has switched camps. Uh, he's working, I believe, with TJ Dillashaw and Juan Archuleta and that team over there uh, in California. So uh, that'll be interesting to see if that's worked out as well. And for Zombie, of course, he's got a couple fights in. I uh, had the fight against Moicano last year where he knocked him out in 58 seconds and then, of course, knocked out Edgar in the first round as well. We did have a chance to speak with Eddie Cha here on the channel. Check that out. That is a Korean Zombies head coach. He did his entire camp in Korea, brought in some UFC vets, including Johnny Case and Bobby Moffat to help him prepare for the fight. But the big thing that Eddie Cha talked about in that interview is the fact that, you know, uh, Zombies had some short shoulder issues. Those have been corrected. He says he's a lot stronger now. Cha told us that Korean Zombie could barely do any chin-ups. Now he's doing them like, you know, clockwork. So I like the fact that Cha mentioned that Zombie's a lot stronger here. And I'd imagine if you're a little bit stronger, the knockout power is going to be there even more. So stylistic we know Ortega is amazing on the ground. Um, and, and if it gets there, it could get interesting. But we know Zombie's got some uh, nice submission victories himself as well. So I am picking Korean Zombie in this fight for a number of reasons. I think he's the better stand-up fighter. I think if it does go to the ground, Zombie can hold his own, even though I think Ortega is a lot more skilled there. But you got to get it to the ground. And I think Zombie, training with the guys he's training with, that won't happen. So I'm going to take Zombie by knockout in this fight, maybe third, fourth round. But I do like Zombie in this one. Let's hear from a featherweight, though. What, who are you picking in this one? Way, so I have a little bit of salt about this fight. So I took Ortega. I was on the Ortega train on Holloway, and I stacked up against Holloway. And then watch him be exposed. I say exposed because until that fight, he there was nothing really that anybody saw. Like he, he was so dominant. But then Holloway just goes in there and picks him apart. Now, going into the Korean Zombie, you mentioned Johnny Case. Johnny Clay, Case is a very close friend of mine and a very close training partner. I trained with him yesterday. I'll be training with him today here in a couple hours. 
He told me that Korean Zombie is on point right now. His camp is going perfect. He's injury free, uh, and this guy's in there to bang. You know, John Johnny's a lightweight. He's you know he's a you know rising lightweight UFC vet. Uh, he's looking to get in the PFL right now, and. Uh, he says he, he hates, and he was only sparring with him three rounds a day, and he hates getting in there because about the intensity the, the zombie brings, how much power he brings, and how well-rounded he is, too. So, you know, I'm going to have to go with zombie, taking Johnny's word for it of how good he is. Uh, last time, Ortega, can he get those mental monsters out? Because I know Ortega lost some sleep after getting his ass whipped by Holloway. I know I lost sleep with how much money I lost in the fight, so I know he <laughs> lost some, uh, some sleep going into this. Um, I'm taking Korean Zombie, uh, you know, to follow because, like I said, I talked to Johnny Case just yesterday about this, and uh, I, you know, I, although he's a favorite, he's not a huge favorite. Uh, you said minus one seventy or minus one eighty. Yeah, he's and, uh, he's right right now. He's uh, minus uh, one eighty nine right now on Blitz Bet. So yeah, d- decent favorite. Not not quite two to one, but close enough. I'm I'm gonna watch the line and hopefully if you know if I can get down to like 150 or 160 I'm stacking up like I said I trust Johnny and if he's if Korean Zombie is in as good good shape as he says he is and again Johnny's a lightweight this is a featherweight going in and dominating a very seasoned fighter like Johnny Case you know week in and week out day after day uh, I, I'm taking Korean Zombie uh, you know by by voice of Johnny Case. Yeah, should be a great fight. Other thing I'll mention, I mentioned the bad blood there. You know, talk to Eddie Cha about that. You know, is he going to get too emotional in this one? Cha says that his emotions are in check. So, because I don't think Zombie's had an opponent that's got under his skin before. So that'll be a little bit interesting, sort of the mental warfare. But Zombie knows, I mean, if he wins this fight, I'm almost positive he's going to get the title shot next against Volkanovski. So he's not going to risk it by getting too much of a hothead in this fight. But we'll definitely see how this one unfolds on Saturday night. Um, we're quickly going to get to Bellator because we do have a little bit of time here. And then we'll get to you, obviously, at the end, Justin. Big fight for you coming up here. Uh, we're not, we're not going to keep this very long. We've got the main event, uh, Cyborg and Blenko. I think this is pretty obvious. I think Cyborg is going to win this fight. Although I will mention Blenko did go the distance with Julia Budd uh, in her a couple of years ago. I actually went the distance with her twice, including one fight where a lot of people pe- felt like Blenko did end up winning. Blenko's coming off the win over Leslie Smith. I think this will be closer than people think. If you go on uh, Blitzbet right now, uh, Cyborg about a five to one favorite in this fight. Well deserved. I think Cyborg can still compete at a high level. Um, I am picking Cyborg here in the co-main event. We've got Patrici P- Patrici Pitbull. Taking on Jaleel Willis, the newcomer. I don't think Jaleel Willis won his last fight against DeJesus. Coming into Bellator, fighting a savvy veteran in Patricky Pitbull, who's fought the who's who. I like Pitbull there for the for the win in that one, so I'll take him there. We've got another interesting fight in the bantamweight division, Ricky Bandeas and Leandro Higo squaring off. I like Bandeas in this one. Tough, tough go of the last couple of fights, having to fight Sergio Pettis and some of the other killers in that division here, like Patrick Mix. I think Bandeas bounces back in a big way against Higo, who's also turned things around in his Bellator career. And the other fight I wanted to mention quickly on this card, Canadian Mandel Nalo coming off his first loss, trains at TriStar. He's going to be taking on Syed Awad. Awad's a vet, way more experienced, but I'm going to go with Nalo in this one. I think everyone I talk to at TriStar tells me this guy is the secret weapon at the gym. We just don't know how good he is yet. I think Nalo bounces back in a big way and gets the win over Awad, despite coming off that ankle injury in his first loss. I think he gets it done. So any quick thoughts on Bellator? And then we'll, we'll get to you here, Justin, because uh, kudos to Bellator, too, for doing a Thursday night card. I'm very interested in this one. Uh, you know, Cyborg, again, 5-1 to one favorite. Can never bet against Cyborg. I didn't bet against her in the news. I've trained with her. She is a stud. She hits like a lightweight, like a lightweight man like this. You can't put money against her. Uh, her opponent, you said, beat uh, what, a butt. What, what yeah, Julia name? Butt, yeah. Julia Butt. You know, never heard of the name before. You know, everyone Cyborg's beat, I've heard. She's been at the top level for so long. Although she's getting later in her career, it's hard to go against that. Going for Pitbull, uh, again, I can't go against any of the Pitbull brothers, man. It's th- These guys are packing a punch here. Uh, knockout Central written all over them. Uh, again, I'm taking Cyborg and Pitbull for the win. Uh, the other couple fights you mentioned, I- I'm not very familiar with, so I, I don't have an opinion on them. No worries. Like the honesty there. All right. Got to quickly talk about Bellator. And then we're going to talk about you. I know I did miss something earlier in the show, uh, my producer, but uh, I will get to that. Uh, maybe I won't get to it today. It's, it's all good. But uh, I want to talk about Bellator going to Thursdays. I love this move. This is their first card on CBS Sportsnet. This is the right move to do. They've been on Fridays forever. Fridays are fine. I mean, it's okay to do that. But then you got some regional MMA mixed in there that usually do their shows on Friday. I like the Thursday time slot. And what Bellator is doing, make no mistake about it, they are taking advantage of the PFL not doing shows right now. Because PFL, that was their slot on Thursday nights. 
Kudos to Bellator for going on Thursdays. They got a really strong card here to kick things off with Cyborg, one of their big pieces, and Patricky Pipple, who's always exciting. So I like the move for Thursday nights for Bellator. I think it's going to be very successful for them. And I like the fact that we get an extra day to watch some fights here as opposed to putting them with the rest of the regional shows, which usually go on Friday here. Kudos to Scott Coker and everyone else who made that decision. Just wanted to mention that I'm a fan of Bellator going to Thursday nights here on the program. But let's get to you, Justin. Big fight coming up here against Gabriel Benitez on November 14th. You must be excited. I know the last fight didn't go your way, but uh, you had your moments in that one. I actually picked you in that fight, believe it or not. You can go back and watch the tape here. But uh, tough outing against a Canadian and Gavin Tucker. Uh, what, first off, what did you take the, the most away from that loss to, to Tucker? Uh, you know, it was a very emotional time, <laughs> to, say the, to say the least, the loss. But uh, mostly it's just the weight, man. It's like I, I'm, I'm caught in between. I need a 150-pound weight class. 145, too, I'm a big 145, or I'm a small 155, or I think I'd be a great 150-pound. But the weight cut, I feel, is what really got to me. And I'm not taking away from Gavin because he's so tough. And he's game. He's strong. He's powerful. He's a, he's a black belt under Henzo Gracie. He's an incredible Muay Thai kickboxer. Uh, but then again, it wasn't really the Justin James that you saw. You saw Justin James for the first round. After I locked in that guillotine choke, man, I, I, I was dead to right. He was dead to rights. His pants come off. It loosens up. He gets out. And honestly, uh, I am the first person, I think, in UFC history to pull his opponent's pants down. So there, at least I got that out of it. But with that being said, man, it's that weight cut whooped my ass so bad. Um, unfortunately, you know, you got to see Justin James for one round. Second round, I took my ass whooping. Third round, I tried to come back with what I had, got knee in the head, you know, and, and, and got uh, got finished there for the first time in my professional career, which was it was a big letdown. But again, you know, I just need to figure out better ways to to get this weight off, man. I lost thirty five. I lost thirty pounds in uh, in three weeks. It just it just wasn't. I, I was worried about the whole camp, and it is what it is. You know, I've made my adjustments at the PI now, working with Clint Waterberg and you know Dennis Davis, my head coach, Andrew Jacoby, my athletic trainer, Roman Isbell. Uh, you know, and, and a whole bunch of Matt Crowley working at the PI. We're hoping for an easier weight cut and I'll have more gas in the tank, uh, going forward. And style wise, how do you look at that fight with Benitez? A lot of experience coming into this one, 29, uh, career fights, uh, style wise. How do you, how do you like this fight? Hey, you know, I see this fight just like the, uh, um, just like the last one, man, it's, he's a good southpaw. He's rangy. Uh, you know, he's, he's a little bit taller now. So, you know, we're gonna have to play with that range coming in, cutting distance. He has an incredible left kick. He's going to try and tear apart the inside of my leg. He's going to try and take decapitate me with that kick. He's going to be going to the body. I need to be blocking and firing, man. This is, uh, it, 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 this is a banger, dude, and, and this is what it comes down to for me is I want you, I want, you know, all, all the other, when they see my name on a card, like, and they see my opponent, they're setting these opponents up for banger fights. This guy doesn't have any interest in wrestling. I don't have any interest in wrestling. I don't give a fuck. You know, what's his name said? Oh, he, you know, we expect him to take us down. I don't have any interest. I have interest in making 50 grand, knocking his head off or him knocking my head off for fight of the night. So, you know, again, this is going to be a banger fight and uh, I'm really excited about it, man. Like I said, just getting my weight in check right now for the next four weeks and, uh, all in a day, baby. Justin, can't thank you enough for co-hosting today. I know we always zoom through these shows, but uh, there's so much to cover here today. Glad we got a little Bellator in here as well. Uh, if there's anyone you want to thank, any sponsors, any social media you want to plug, I'll give you uh, the second last word as I'm going to get the last word and do a couple housekeeping things. But uh, thanks again, man. Hey, I, I, I really appreciate you. You know, uh, yeah, if you want to follow me on Instagram, J-A-Y-0-9-M-I, Twitter, Justin James MMA, or Facebook, just Justin James, man. I appreciate you. Hey, and uh, like I mentioned, want to thank everyone for watching here today. Hit that subscribe button, hit the like button. My best interviews every week are on this channel. So we've interviewed Walt Harris recently, talked to Lauren Murphy last week. And on this card, I'm one of the few guys that got an interview with Eddie Cha leading into this fight, a Korean Zombies coach. So definitely go check that out. Really good insight into Korean Zombies camp in Korea. So uh, definitely want to tune into that. Uh, follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at Lynch on Sports. And uh, make sure you watch the show every Monday, 1.15 p.m. Eastern time, Octagon Outlook. I always get a UFC fighter to co-host with me so i have uh, some idea of what i'm talking about actually talking to a real fighter here so really appreciate you guys watching we'll be back monday like i mentioned next monday this coming monday at 1 15 p.m eastern time i hope you guys enjoyed it and i will see you next week and once again thanks to justin for uh, doing an awesome job today co-hosting the show we'll see you guys next week